uh, welcome everyone. I think the others will just tag along uh, as we start. Uh, but yes, welcome. My name is Melody Patry. I am Advocacy Director at Access Now, and I've been working on the Keep It On campaign even before actually I worked at Access Now. So I'm really honored to start this press briefing and to have this conversation today discussing um, the internet and elections or actually the lack of internet during elections which unfortunately seem to seem to become a trend so i'm here today with my colleague uh, felicia antonio who is the lead uh, who is coordinating the keep it on campaign a lot of you have maybe uh, have uh, have heard her uh, via the kill switch podcasts which we will be uh, linking as part of the resources that are available. Um, and then, of course, we have great speakers uh, today who will be available to answer questions and they will be introducing themselves and uh, say a couple of remarks in a minute. But just as we're starting, I wanted to put a bit of context into the reason why we're having this press briefing because at some point I was having a bit of a deja vu. And um, last year we had another press briefing also on internet shutdowns and elections. And unfortunately, the reason why we have another one this year with a similar uh, theme is because what was last year, let's say like the, the premises and the right. beginning of the trend is turning into a, a real concern that we have for democracy. We've been able to identify new patterns uh, when it comes to internet shutdowns and election. And by internet shutdowns, we refer to like complete internet blackouts or kill switch, which is when governments completely pull the plug uh, and disconnect the country, but also to um, when platforms are being censored, especially communications platform and information sharing platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, uh, messaging platforms like WhatsApp, Signal, uh, or Facebook Messenger, and so on. So. Um, the the trends are moving the the environment is, is really moving when it comes to elections and shutdown this year we counted 50 incidents of uh, internet disruption since the bits since the beginning of the year so in the past five six months really and a, a few of them of course uh, occurred during elections that was the case in uganda we heard about uh, congo uh, so there were um it is a it is a concern, and so I really want to make sure that we have the space to discuss um, many concerns, but also challenges, and if we have them, solutions. Uh, if you have specific questions for our speakers, uh, they will present themselves, and you will know exactly their area of expertise. As we have a few elections coming up, so it will be really um, relevant to hear from them and to also feel prepared, we actually um, launched a handbook uh, on elections and shutdown destined specifically for reporters uh, covering elections and for um, elections monitors. So that's another resource that we'll be sharing with you all. And I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. Uh, this press conference is recorded. so. You know, like, uh, although we're not all in a room, but just consider that it's re it's recorded and uh, the, the question and the answers will be publicly available afterwards. So if there is something maybe like sensitive that you would not want uh, to be shared publicly, uh, please be uh, mindful that this is recorded and that there are other opportunities to also connect uh, with the speakers and, and with access now. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to my colleague Felicia if she has extra words and then we can immediately kick off with our great speakers and uh, the questions that I hope you all have. Yes, thank you very much, Melody, and welcome everyone. Um, quickly, um, as Melody said, this will be recorded and we have uh, friends from the media um, joining us. So if you have questions, uh, you have the option to turn on your camera and mute your mic and speak. Um, if you're doing that, please um, introduce yourself and your organization or affiliation, and then 
you can also use the chat button, but we encourage you to use the video and mic so that um, the session is interactive um, as we go on. So I would quickly ask uh, um, speakers uh, who have made time to join us to quickly take two to three minutes to introduce themselves. Um, so you tell us your name, organization, and the current state of internet shutdowns in wherever you are speaking from. Um, all right, so I would hand over to Amir to kick start. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, organization Access Now and everyone who participated to this press conference. Uh, my name is Amir Rashidi. I'm the Director of Internet Security and Digital Rights at Myon Group, New York-based organization, human rights organization. Um, uh, we are working on uh, violation of human rights and definitely access to the internet is a rights for everyone. And uh, we're trying to basically uh, monitor the situation of internet in Iran from the perspective of connectivity to uh, cyber attack and provide as much as we can support for the civil society and activists people who are at the risk uh, and uh, minority, uh, ethnic minorities inside the country. Uh, the current state of internet, uh, the last internet shutdown we had was in February, 2001 uh, in province of Sistan and Baluchistan for three days, uh, internet, uh, mobile data, only mobile data uh, was shut down and uh, uh, almost every single year we have we have a shutdown in in, in Iran um, and yeah I think for now that's it we can we can we can go over the uh, uh, details uh, later all right thank you um, I'll move to Richard um, and one of our participants um, speakers is here to join us so hopefully um, she'll be able to make it through so I will move to Richard um, to introduce himself Thank you very much, uh, Felicia, and uh, greetings to everyone in the meeting. I will uh, beg that uh, I keep my video off uh, so that I can leverage the bandwidth uh, because I'm out of town. You know, in Zambia, the further you move away from the capital city, the, the quality of internet also deteriorates. <laughs> so to avoid that disruption, uh, I will beg that uh, maybe I can just um, uh, um, speak without the, the camera. Actually, I'm, I had to drive a, a few uh, kilometers to access the, the network. I'm actually doing this from, from, from the car that we are using, you know, so I will, um, I'll beg to do that. So, but anyway, uh, my name is Mulonga Richard. I'm the team lead at uh, Bloggers of Zambia. Uh, we are a, a growing enterprise in Zambia. Our work is primary focus on uh, three pillars, uh, internet governance and uh, digital rights, um, media rights and freedoms, and then um, online creative content and platform management. So do our work through campaigning, advocacy, trainings, and just everything that just influences law and policy, everything that draws attention to what we think must be done about uh, making the internet accessible, you know, affordable, and to keep it on, to keep the, the internet uh, on during all this time. Um, in Zambia, we haven't had uh, an internet shutdown. Uh, we, we usually say, we usually put the word yet at the end because we are going towards an election and the internet in Zambia has become a very special area of interest by the state. So they are weaponizing the narrative that uh, Zambians are abusing social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, where they are insulting and criticizing government leaders. And so they have come up with the Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act that has got uh, several provisions that are parallel to the constitution and other subsidiary laws like Article 18 of the constitution that guarantees and protects uh, freedom of expression, and Article 17 of the Constitution that uh, guarantees and protects um, the right to, to assembly. So 
There are also public order laws, like yeah, the Public Order Act, the NGO Act, that are used, you know, in the physical space to just tie for people's assembly and all that. So as we go towards an election, we expect the Cyber Security and Cyber Crimes Act actually to be used to shut down the internet because we have seen examples are used like Uganda, Zimbabwe, and look what is happening there. So sometimes we think it is in the, to maintain public order and hygiene and it's better to switch off the internet. So it's shut down, but in the past we have had um, like internet uh, 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 jamming, filtering, and website blockages, like we have the Zambian watchdog that is really critical of the government. So we wouldn't accept the, uh, access the website because uh, service providers have been asked to 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 what to 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 block the access. So that is that is um, the, the the synopsis uh, where we are, and I will just uh, pass the button back to Felicia. Thank you very much. Um, so we. Um, our speakers are from countries that are having elections um, this year or have already had elections um, in 2021. And we're trying to see how we can strengthen our advocacy on internet shutdowns and elections. And so I would call on um, Harold to introduce himself. Thanks, Felicia. Uh, you heard me. Okay. Thanks, uh, I'm Arroda Jaho. I'm an IT engineer, specialist of a cyber governance organization and president of Internet Society Benet chapter. So thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk uh, about Internet shutdown and what we're going to fight it. So my organization uh, is up, uh, ISOC Benet, is a national chapter of Internet Society and uh, how a credo is and remains uh, to defend an open internet, globally connect, accessible and secure for all. And uh, in Benin, we are done different things credo, full project and action with high impact. So uh, our last uh, action is to, to document all major events of the internet as experienced in our country, full republication of the book of the history of internet in Benin uh, from starting to present day. Uh, sorry, this is good. And uh, I'm making transition to for this sentence to, to answer the, the last question. I, at Benin, uh, Many relatively stable periods uh, in terms of internet shutdown or uh, censorship of internet service. We have experienced uh, experienced a period of censorship, large increase. We were uh, in internet access costs due to the over uh, uh, from uh, social networks and a complete shutdown in uh, during the parliamentary election in April uh, uh, 2019. So this is just an, an introduction. I can come back uh, to explain uh, uh, another yes, stage. Um, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I would call on Marie, Marianne, my colleague, to introduce herself uh, because she'll be stepping in while we wait for one of our speakers to join. So, Marianne. Yes, hi. Um, I'm Marianne Diaz. I am a researcher from Venezuela, currently living in Chile. And I have been working on several issues regarding censorship and human rights rights on basically the whole spectrum of human rights online for a decade now and every time I say that I feel very very old <laughs> but right now I'm working on keep it on um on shutdowns and internet disruptions and it it is a very important year for us in Latin America because we have elections all across the region um Venezuela itself has um, mega elections at the end of the of the year 
this is what we call mega elections means that we get to choose i can't vote but we get to choose um different stages of, of government chile where i live has um two elect big elections this year and we also have elections in nicaragua we just have peru um honduras and the different kind of democracies across uh, the region make it um, very different in the circumstances of the uh, a blockage and, and a general internet blackout of or, or or internet censorship of certain size can occur. And so it's, it's very different. For instance, what might happen right now in Colombia with the protest, or to what can happen in Chile or in Uruguay. And so we need to be very, very aware. But what uh, a main trend that, that, that I would like to highlight is the, the use of inter infrastructural failure to disconnect regions, entire regions or towns or cities, or even the whole country that has happened in Cuba a few times, um, which is extremely hard to track, extremely hard to um attribute and uh, for us is a, a, a bit, really big challenge that we need to be aware that it's going to be happening more and more in the coming year or so thank you very much marianne um, for um stepping in to speak on what's happening in latin america um before we dive into the questions or the discussion properly, I want to remind our participants that um, you have the option to ask questions and contribute to the discussion. So you can use the raise hand chat um, button and we'll be um, happy to call you to speak. And then um, for the speakers also, we will be taking screenshots if that is okay with you in order to promote um, the session, the, the session after um, we upload it on, um, we make it public. So please take note. All right, I'm handing over to Melody to kick start. Sure, so as you saw, we've got representation from various regions, various continents around the world, because one of the conclusions that we were already able to draw after a few years of doing this campaigning and doing research related to the Keep It On campaign is that no one is, um, no one is excluded, to be fair. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, every region has been concerned by uh, internet shutdowns during election. And so a first question that is quite broad and general, but to keep us started and maybe to put everyone on, um, to give like background context to everyone is that we've noticed that governments have used uh, internet shutdowns in a way or another, whether it's, as we said, like a total shutdowns or just like a, a targeted one or the targeting of specific platforms. They've been doing this just before, during and or after elections. So to all of our speakers, my question is, why do you think that govern governments are so quick to hit the kill switch during these important national events? What are they afraid of? What reason do they give? How, how do they match reality? Can I go? Okay, Richard, go ahead. So in our case, um, our, from, from our experience, why the internet remains targeted uh, is because the our government would like to control our freedom. They would like to um, control our, our, our freedom of expression, uh, assembly and association on the internet, that we should be limited in what we can do with the internet with regard to speaking truth to power, um, ensuring that there is transparency and accountability, to scrutinize those that are in leadership, to scrutinize those that want to, that are vying for political office. Because um, people would use the traditional media, but it is so gagged and the censorship, 
and certain critical voices actually in the civil society and journalists, radio stations here are, are closed without reason. Journalists are beaten when they write critical pieces. Some media houses actually attacked on live phone ins because of what they said or who they are hosting. So as a result, everyone is going to the internet that is open and inclusive and participatory. And um, so the government doesn't like that, that people should be free to uh, just you know, participate in the democracy. So we, you see, freedom of expression is the engine of democracy in our view that without a, a freedom of expression, democracy cannot function. Without a participation and inclusion, democracy is dead. So our democracy is actually dying because uh, uh, the, the government doesn't want people to, to speak, people to, to offer their opinions and ideas. So the internet is at the center of this and, and we are going into an election in, in, in less than 50 days. And the inspector general of police, the ministers, and just anyone who has access to the national broadcaster, they are threatening people who are abusing social media. Now we have taken time to study what they're calling abuse of social media. These are just critical voices that are, that are, that are critical of the government, the president, his wife, and, and just all the wrong that is going on. So they don't like it. And they're calling it abuse of social media that uh, Zambians are insulting the president and his wife and the, the ministers. So um, the internet is a bad thing. Uh, it must be regulated, it must be controlled. And the, uh, everyone who puts bad content like insulting the president must be arrested. And they are, in the, in, the, in, the, in the law that I, I, I talked about earlier on, the penalties are unrealistic. They are, they are unjustifiable, they are harsh, they are, they are, they are too hard to, compre to comprehend just for people who are exercising their right to freedom of expression on the internet. So that is our story. May I add something from the Tatam perspective to this good question? Um, it's very clearly like the, the first factor that um, has a way in that is that governments want to restrict freedom of information because they don't want to, um, they, don't, they don't want information about police abuse to get out. That's the first line basically. But a second thing that I, I think we need to consider is that centralization in Latin America is a thing, an actual thing. <laughs> like there is one ISP in most countries that holds 60% of um, traffic and is often controlled by government, it's public. And so it's very easy to use a kill switch in that provider, just in that provider and radically reduce the capability of people to access the internet. And that that seems very innocuous, like it's okay, this is something that we do in order for more people to be able to access the internet because um, infrastructure is, is expensive and then governments need to get, take care of that. But then it becomes very dangerous because it's very easy for them to do that without any kind of procedure. And this is something that repeats across the region. And it is uh, very difficult to handle because it also means that there is no transparency at all when the shutdowns happen. There is no explanation. It's very difficult to run technical tests in order to find out what's happening. And, and it, it, is, it is a regional thing. May I add uh, one more point? So uh, I, I, I think, uh, just, just um, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, things that uh, my colleagues and friends they they, they said, and um, my experience is one of the reasons that they shut down the internet is because simply they don't they they want to shut down the communication, they don't want people to talk to each other to mobilize and you know basically to act against the uh, whatever is the will of the the, the government and the state. Uh, and and now now these days they shutting down the internet. But before that internet were, were really popular, and you know uh, everyone in Iran had access to the internet back in uh, 2009, the, the time that the Silla was in Iran, that we saw a really widespread a national wide protest after the I would say that was the first widespread protest after the revolution in Iran, 
the the internet was like we had the main connection was dial up so it was not like really and and they were not really 3g and 4g back then in iran uh so what what they did was shutting down the mobile phone and 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 text messages so you see that 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 we are seeing this trend is shifting to the internet because now internet is the main tools of communication between all of the activists and all the people uh who wants to protect their rights so uh so uh, shutting down the communication with activists and people is one of the main goal and of course they can have the because they have the state media they can have their own narrative publishing their own narrative about what is going on and why uh, why people are protesting i actually have a follow up question uh amir about what you just said in terms of cutting access to communications because in the past, and actually it's also related to what you said, Mariana, about um, centralization of internet service providers. We know that in a, in a number of countries, there is also a centralization of the media, <laughs> some of which also is controlled by government. And so I'd like to draw this parallel between, you know, like when governments were able to control and influence the media, in that case, the censorship or the, the control over the content was maybe a bit more pernicious, as opposed to what we're seeing now, which is when governments decide to censor the internet, uh, not just via removing some websites here and there, but really shutting down the internet or shutting down part of the internet or part of the internet services. What can you say, like, what do you think it says about this new trend, which, or, or is it different? Is it the same thing? Because it feels the perception feels different when you just don't have access. It's different to have access to something that has been, you know, like tempered with or 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 or, or controlled. So yeah, that was my question to you in terms of the differences and and um, what do you think that means as as a threat maybe or as not so much of a threat to to democracy and the electoral process. Sure, that's that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, the, the, in a country like Iran, uh, uh, the, the state media, radio and TV, they are absolutely under control of the, the, the government. And by the government, I don't mean uh, the, the administration and presidential office. I mean the office of the supreme leader. So it's like a level higher than, than regular uh, uh, government that we talk about in, in, in uh countries is basically like kind of having king and then like like uh, uh, another position so so they, they they want to have absolute control over the over everything that people are are here least uh, hearing or watching uh and this is not just about the news it's about like a culture movie uh you know about like like Blocking Netflix, obviously blocking Netflix is both sides because of the tech sanctions as well. But but blocking like uh, the watching the live stream video and you know news everything. But something that is completing uh, basically uh, this puzzle in Iran is the the local infrastructure of the internet, the localization of the internet. So the goal uh, in Iran is. To tell people to sell this idea to the to, to the uh, to people that you don't need to access to the uh, uh, internet or what they call it international internet, you don't need to have access to that. You don't need to have access to anything outside the country. We are going to provide whatever you need inside Iran. And in order to sell that idea to the people, they are even subs subsidized the internet traffic in Iran. If you see the, if you use the local services in Iran, you pay half a price than using the international services. So that's include all the news media, all the news website, all the uh, 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 broadcasting inside the country, as well as communication tools, messaging apps, email services, and, and everything. So, so the, 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 the final goal is to keep everything in, and right now 70% of internet traffic is local traffic inside the country. So we are not really far from uh, being totally cut off from the rest of the world. So that, that's, that's the main goal, localization and selling the idea to the people that whatever you need, news, communication, whatever you need is inside the country and forget about the outside. 
Can you complete? Uh... Uh, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, just to complete, uh, I mean, talking. The reason often given to justify an extended shutdown uh, is uh, to fight against the spread of fake news, to prevent dissemination of a message of incitation to uh, hatred, a uh, call to for popular imprisonment, and sometimes for reasons of national security. Uh, I don't know. But that does correspond to the reality of our because and then penetration in my country for experience has not become a significant enough factor that could have explained the 2019 internet shutdown during the election. So we can constate uh, this phenomenon is uh, really growing now. Today, at almost uh, every election in a country, we can expect an internet shutdown. Uh, the last uh, example is uh, Congo. Congo, Republic of Congo, where despite the campaign to prevent the use of it, simply cuts the, simply cuts the internet of election day. So uh, this is to say how recurrent that has become. Social media outlet primarily uh, affect service and can easily bypass with a complex outage of affect the internet network and has global impact that for just for its censorship. So it's not, uh, I think so. That. Thanks. Yes, um, thank you all for your um, submissions. And I do agree, they resonate very well with um, the um, findings that we come across under the Keep It On campaign. And um, I normally see that the government seem to be learning from each other. Um, um, once a government shuts down the internet during election, whether it's solved the problems or the justifications they would normally give or not, another country would um, repeat um, something similar uh, in response to elections. And one thing we've also noticed is the um, correlation between offline and online repression. So um, normally you know or have reports of journalists being arbitrarily det detained or arrested um, or human rights violations being um, perpetrated on the ground. And then um, shutdowns actually make it difficult for the same journalists, um, uh, human rights defenders to um, access information around these human rights violations. Um, and this is very dangerous for the human rights community. So before we continue the discussion, I just want to find out from our participants, um, is, uh, do you have any questions um, at this point? And if you do, please raise your hand or unmute yourself and speak, if that's okay with you. Okay, um, Beatrice. Hello. Uh, my name is Beatrice. I work for the BBC in the United Kingdom. And I've got a question for Marianne. You talked about infrastructure failures in South America, cutting off areas in terms of internet connectivity. Are you suggesting that their infrastructure failures because of lack of, in the genuine infrastructure failures because of lack of investment and that is a threat to democracy? Or are you suggesting that they're deliberate infrastructure failures on the parts of government in order to shut down the internet? That's an excellent question, Beatrice, thank you. I am suggesting both. <laughs> there is infrastructural failure that happens for lack of maintenance and for lack of, of investment. And this is a, a reality because we are mostly a, a poor region with variations somewhat drastic between country to country, but still poor. Um, but as uh, work that my colleagues have done and myself have done suggests, 
in some places, the lack of investment in infrastructure for telecommunications is a political decision. <laughs> so if you are deciding to put that money into um, social control, into technology for social control, or into the military, instead of managing your infrastructure in a way that allows people to connect at, at a, an, an adequate level, then that's a political choice when you have a, a failure of that kind. On the other hand, in places like my country, which is a failed state, when you have a certain kind of infrastructural failure, and then they say, oh, this entire city was cut off from, from the internet for three days. At the same time, I protest what was happening and tanks were coming in to deal with the protesters, but this, there was an absolute blackout. So there's no information from that. And, but no, it was an iguana that ate the cable because as you know, in my country, iguanas like to eat cables, like it's very delicious to them. So that kind of infrastructure cut, it is very much not an accident. And, and when you are inside, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's still difficult to prove from a, from a technical investigative standpoint, but for a person who is inside the blackout, it is very obvious <laughs> and it's very easy to see that it is intentional. So yes, I think that those two things are at place at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Beatrice, for your question. Okay, I have another hand, Willan. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. And no, that's fine. Uh, my name is uh, Wieland van Dijk. I'm, uh, I work for NRC in the Netherlands. Um, and I have a question really for all the speakers. Thank you all for your interesting um, uh, contributions. Um, I was wondering that for a for a regime to shut down the internet, there is a true there's 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 costs. Um, it disrupts businesses. Um, it takes down electronic banking. It's not something that you can uh, easily do without harming your economy, the further economy outside the the internet. And I was wondering if you're seeing um, regimes uh, keeping that into account, uh, developing their technical capabilities to to um, to limit the, uh, the these um, uh, consequences. So, uh, well, interested uh, in your uh, opinion on that. Can I answer that? Please do. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that, that's that's really very, very uh, good question. Um, I can speak about Iran. So your, your, your point is right, but uh, it's interesting to know what Iran is doing to basically reduce that cost as, as much as possible. The entire reason that they created this local infrastructure, as they call it, National Information Network, or we usually address uh, that like uh, uh, national internet, right? Uh, but the official name is National Information Network. That, the, the entire reason that they want to localize everything inside the country is to reduce the cost of internet shutdown. The, 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 the internet shutdown that we had in, uh, let me check my calendar, in, in November, 2009, more than 12 days, actually was a test to see if they can reduce that cost. Because when, when they, they encourage people to come inside the country, use the local services and infrastructure, it was because when they shut down the internet, the local services, they, 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 they can work. Like we have like Iranian Uber, uh, Snap, that it was totally working. Uh, online banking was totally working. And it's interesting to know there is, a, there is an international angle that actually helped Iranian government to do that. You know, the, the U.S. takes sanctions. When the entire uh, basically encouraging program uh, subsidized the traffic, everything that they did to encourage people to move inside the country and use the local services was a failure project simply because no one trusted the government. But because of the U.S. tax sanctions, people were kicked out from the international infrastructures like AWS, Digital Ocean, and all of these. 
And the only solution, only option was moving back inside Iran. And that's actually the reason we are seeing uh, in, in November shutdown that local services was working fine and they were happy actually it was a test and international services was uh, uh, inaccessible to the Iranian government. So the things that makes me honestly afraid and scared of the future of localization uh, is not because of the technical infrastructure, which is good. It's good that you can access to the data uh, fast and you no know, cheap. That, that the technical side is fine, but the policy maker, how they use this infrastructure makes me really scared to see the same pattern on other countries uh, that that is going to happen. It, it, it's going to be a really, really a scary situation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank That's you very much. Very interesting. OK, um, we have Jian. Hi, sorry, I didn't realize question. I had to use the raise hand feature in the chat, so I was waving my hand beforehand. <laughs> uh, to all the panelists, uh, I have a question. Um, so from from what I've understood, there are in some cases some legal measures that are, that are underpinning some of these shutdowns, such as, for instance, in Zambia. Uh, so I was wondering, in order to challenge shutdowns, is there any way to use courts? Is that effective? Are leaders in these countries going to really take notice? Or is the solution to this problem going to come from wider, I don't know, diplomatic pressure? or technological disruption, what is going to end this? Are courtrooms going to be one way or should we just wait for something new to arise, some kind of more decentralized internet structure uh, or, I don't know, Biden being very angry? Can I go from Zambia since it was mentioned? <laughs> yes, so, yes. yes, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, in Zambia, that is, that is under, under a, a what? Um, an ideal situation in an ideal environment, the courts uh, were supposed to have um, hope in the courts were supposed to have um, that relief, but that is not how it is, you know? Uh, so you find the, the appointment of judges and how the judges behave when they're on the benches very biased and you can see the influence of the ruling elite in court decisions so uh, but not all hope is lost uh, we we currently have a petition before the courts because we have challenged the cyber crime and cyber security act and sometimes it's a, we, we it's, you just have to do the action so that you exhaust all the um, the, the, the the processes but the courts in zambia especially when it comes to such issues they are not seem to be helpful because they seem to agree with the state. They, 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 you know, because the courts are the old judges and all that, so they don't like the internet. They think the internet is a source of problems, social media and all that. So even if their rulings are, are, are not pro internet freedoms, but in Zimbabwe, for example, they went to the courts and it was challenged based on the constitution and all that. So we, it's a 50-50 thing, but the confidence that the courts would protect our interests and all that is, is, is very low. It's very low because of what has happened in the past. There's um, very strong political influence in most of our lives, most of the public institutions here, uh, because of intolerance, because of uh, abuse of power, you know, the, the departure from the rule of law police inconsistency and, and all that. So and most decisions are based on a, on a political affiliation. So that is the problem we have. Maybe also I can respond to the other question like the, the impact of uh, internet shutdown. Like how do they, how do, do, do our leaders see it? So in Zambia, for as long as anything that threatens those that are the, among the ruling elite, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but they'll just go ahead and make an unpopular decision. So even if the internet shutdown is costly on the economy here, they'll still do it and they pretend that uh, they did it because it was threatening national security and hygiene. And this is our, our what? Our argument, like what should we prioritize between national security 
and the freedoms, especially internet freedoms. Because often the way the, the phrase national security actually does not defeat what action is being discussed. So we find that anything that someone says, or when there are these hackathons, when there are all these online protests, they say, you know, this is threatening national security. And what is national security? Come on. Yes, national security, we want that because we want to be safe and secure. But also, what is national security? in the absence of freedoms. You cannot have freedom without security. You cannot have security also uh, in the absence of freedoms. So I find that the national security has been weaponized to, to, to inspire uh, the invocation of all these orders to, to, you know, to shut down internet, to, to legitimize all the wrong things. And, and it doesn't matter whether that also has, has an effect on how the financial technology is running and, and just everything else. So we, the biggest problem we have here is that of growing repression and intolerance to divergent views and, and opinions. That is the only thing that, that, that matters, that those that are, are critical, they must not speak. And we can, they can shut down the internet based on, on, on those criticisms. Very unfortunate, and, and that, is, that is it from, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Richard. I, we are running out of time. And so I just want um, to call um, Harold in. Um, Benin had elections in April this year and um, there was no internet shutdown. Um, you did mention that the internet was disrupted in 2019 during parliamentary elections. But um, could you take us through what happened? And I have to be very miserly with my time. so. Can you use like two minutes to let us know what happened, what changed in Benin to ensure that there was no internet disruption? Thanks, Alicia, for the question. Uh, uh, to 2000 uh, and 2020, we received warning that a possible internet shutdown from uh, municipal election, so it was last year. And for this year, uh, it's, it was the presidential election. So we decided to, a series of proactive action had to be taken to prevent a possible internet shutdown before, during, and after election. So for, uh, for first action, we wish to keep in one. Uh, we finish here for ourselves now to see the open letter that was being written, uh, which was done, and I thank her for the, the opportunity. Secondly, uh, we have posts on social network to promote a platform to fight against fake news. That way have helped to develop food the internet community of the new. We wrote and post on our website, uh, supported by Internet Society Global, to explain the disastrous consequences that an internet shutdown would have on the country, both economically, financially, socially, politically, etc. We, uh, we have made uh, an interview with uh, uh, International Radio RFI. Uh, Radio France International in French to explain the prevailing situation that and the concern we felt. We were feeling so uh, in locally for action with a coalition of uh, other civil society organizations, we launched a very large campaign on social media uh, with tips posters, which explain each day a consequence of internet shutdown, a message of human rights uh, that will not be respected if it is upon. So this campaign, uh, which began nine, nine days, yeah, nine, yeah, nine days before election, uh, less until the end of the elective periods. And uh, we organized uh, uh, with another civil social, uh, civil society, sorry, 
organization, a public conference to inform, raise, uh, denounce a possible shutdown. And the day, the day of election, we have set up a monitoring unit to detecting an internet cut. And uh, we, we post it publicly, uh, public, public, sorry. The state of network in the country. Each hour uh, is a, uh, we have, we also wanted to initiate a press, a press release to prevent but we have no time. So that there's a uh, visas the different action on that web we have put in place. And uh, it was a great joy for us uh, to see that until the day after election, we had online and without major technical problem. So after election, uh, it's okay, it's okay, uh, no change. Okay, all right, thank you very much. And it's indeed, it's always a great joy to um, see that people enjoy their rights on the internet because um, the impacts of internet shutdowns are very devastating. And um, just to add on to what you said, um, the Keep It On um, campaign, we have a, an election tracker which we launched beginning of this year. And so we have all the elections we have um, noted as high risk, that is risk of a shutdown happening um, at, the, at the time of those elections. And so, um, it's on our website, my colleagues will share it in the chat as well. Um, if you are in countries that are identified in this or not, and you anticipate um, an internet disruption, please feel free to reach out and we are happy to work with you or we would reach out to you um, to work with you. So I'll hand over to Melody. Um, to uh, sure, we still have to the uh, end. Yes, of course, and we still have some questions on end, but uh, of course, uh, if reporters in the in the room have questions, please raise your hands uh, or wave, <laughs> and uh, and we'll make sure to to give you the virtual mic. Uh, and also, just wanted to pinpoint that please do have a look at the chat and all of the resources that uh, my colleague Felicia is sharing, including some positive uh, news when it comes to court cases and. Uh, court victories when it, when it comes to internet shutdowns. It's something that we definitely want uh, as a coalition to, to invest in a bit more and to put more resources behind. But of course it depends of, of the context, on the context, sorry, and how we can rely or not on the, on the judicial process. So I have a, a question to all speakers when it comes to, because we have several reporters in the room and so, how can journalists report on internet shutdowns and, and digital repression and support the work that, you, that you're doing? So uh, I'm not asking about like tools that they can use to circumvent uh, shutdowns and so on, like these, uh, these tools. I mean, if there is interest, let me know, but we, we've, we've published some material about it and we're happy to, that, that would um, make us exceed, uh, <laughs> exceed the timeline, but more in terms of, journalists and reporters working on, on that topic when they do cover elections, what would be helpful to your work? Um, uh, and how should they report on internet shutdowns? I have things to say about that. <laughs> um, it is important to me that when reporters cover internet shutdowns or, or any other kind of internet disruption, um, that they make space to tell the story of people affected by it. Because oftentimes they just focus on numbers, which is understandable because numbers are hard and facts and journalists are all about facts. And facts are very important, of course, but if you tell me that, I don't know, 10,000 people were affected, it, it really doesn't sound like much for people. It sounds like it was a small village in some time. It depends, of course, on the people, on the country. But for those people, it's terrible. It is a lot. 
and it affects their livelihood. It affects their ability to study. It affects their ability to work more so over uh, during this pandemic. And if they give space to both, maybe <laughs> to facts and also stories, but also stories are facts. They are just not numbers. And if you keep that in mind, I, I think it makes for a more comprehensive approach to reporting um, something like this. And it makes for people, for the general audience, more easy to understand why a shutdown is important, particularly for those that haven't lived through one. Thank you, Marianne. Any other perspective uh, from our speakers? I can add one, one more point. Uh, based on the experience of the last internet shutdown in the province of Sistan Baluchistan in Iran, um, I think when it comes to like, uh, uh, so I, I, I think one of the best things that they can do is uh, maybe, maybe it's our work actually to provide resources to, to let the journalists know who you need to listen to. Because in the last internet shutdown in Sistan Baluchistan, almost three days before the shutdown, some political opposition for their own political agenda, they said internet is shut down in Sistan Baluchistan, which was, we hadn't shut down back then. Three days after that, that announcement, uh, we had shut down. And the news, the entire news was killed, actually, just because of the false uh, the internet shutdown announcement for their own political agenda. So I, I think you need to basically verify your, your uh, uh, sources to see if like some anonymous person on, on, on Twitter is saying it's shut down and th these people are not living inside the country. So that, 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 that's, that's a uh, problem when we need to basically pay attention to the horrible things that are happening. So uh, I think listening to the real expert local people uh, or like keep it on campaign people, they, they have access to resources and access to the local activists. Uh, I think that that's the most important thing uh, journalists can do. Thank you. Amir, any thoughts from Richard maybe? Or, has, or Harold or has it all? been covered. Oh, sorry, yeah, I can't. I missed your question, sorry. Oh, no, sorry, I was just asking, um, what would be helpful for your work when journalists report on internet shutdowns? So what is helpful in terms of maybe the information that they share or the people that they, 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 they speak to? Okay, uh, about journalists uh, reporting, uh, it's, it's crucial, it's crucial. Because they can help to streaming, streaming live information of information, uh, to educate citizens, uh, ensure prevention. Just, uh, just like that. Yeah, so, and from, from our perspective here in Zambia, we, we feel even journalism itself is, uh, is affected, is impacted by, by internet shutdown, whether it's filtering, jamming, and, and all that. Anything that uh, restricts access to the internet or blocks access to the internet is detrimental to a free and an independent press. But uh, with regard to the content, and all that, the, the, the products of journalism, we think it's very important because it takes the information out there in order to influence internet law and policy. It informs other people, it informs the stakeholders, it, it, it helps to increase the, the standard the, 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 in, based on the regional and global norms on, on what, on the, on, on the, the right to internet access. We feel journalism plays a critical role in informing, in educating. We feel journalism is critical to, to all the narrative because it just um, creates that platform for engagement, that platform, like I said, for influencing and for, for networking for, for people in the West, in the North and everywhere to be able to know what is happening this side 
so that we can be informed about the trends and then we can um, uh, come up with better advocacy and campaign strategies and, and just all that. So uh, we feel it's very important to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to, sorry, Felicia. I just wanted to quickly um, follow up on one, of, actually a few things that our speakers have shared when it comes to sharing data or, or sharing statistics, because whether it's the number of people affected, uh, it's also the case for the, the number of shutdowns. And we've faced this because we, we published this annual report and, and, um, and periodic updates about the number of shutdowns. And so if you look at the number since 2019, the numbers have been decreasing, which could, you know, like we could celebrate it and be like, yes, the Keep It On campaign is doing great work and we have fewer shutdowns and it's less of an issue. But unfortunately, we can't celebrate uh, in this way because um, while the number of shutdowns has reduced last year, for example, and since the beginning of the year, we've seen a, a dip as well compared to the, the first half of uh, the first half of, half of the year of the previous years. Uh, but what we've noticed, however, is that the shutdowns last longer or that the, the networks that are affected can maybe like affect more people and so on. So it's always tricky, even for us uh, working on this issue to convey um, what exactly is happening or who exactly is impacted and, and what we can learn from and the different patterns when we look just at the numbers. And that's why that we're trying to always provide this additional context and this additional information when it comes to the nature of shutdown and um, and their impact and and very often actually it's multiple uh, multiple impacts and multiple consequences. So just a quick note from me on sharing numbers and and sharing statistics. Um, but Felicia, over to you. Um, yes, I. Actually, wanted to add um, a suggestion that I think would also be relevant. Um, we do have um, journalists or media that are very interested in the work that we do. So um, let's also proactively identify them or reach out um, to let them know our plans and um, the, the trends that we are noticing in our countries. And um, I'm sure they'll be interested in covering or listening to us once we need a platform to do that. Um, all right. Um, I have one question before we wrap up, Melody. And um, I, Amir and um, Richard, you have elections. Amir, we are working on the Keep It On campaign for Iran, um, and the elections is on the 18th. So, um, what should we expect? This is not to say. Uh, we need you to predict uh, what will happen, but then uh, what do you, what does the landscape look like? And the same question to you, Richard. Your elections are scheduled um, for August, and um, we would be working with you on a campaign. So if you can also let us know what we should expect and how should we prepare to prevent a shutdown, that would be great. Richard, you want to go ahead? I can go, but uh, I mean, you you were mentioned first, so I'll go after you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I, I think we, so so far what 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 we are seeing is uh, it seems that the outcome of election is already decided. So because uh, you know, speaking of the going to the court for the like shutdown, uh, we don't have the rule of law in Iran, right? So going to the court, we don't have that kind of luxury, unfortunately, in Iran. So it seems that the, the, the outcome of election is, is clear. We know who is going to win the election. Uh, and this person, definitely, Ebrahim Raisi, he is not definitely in favor of internet freedom and his team. Uh, I, I talked to a couple of people from his team on, on different rooms on Clubhouse, and it's clear that they are not in favor of internet freedom at all, and they are not familiar with the basic definition of the internet freedom. 
And right now, what, this person is important. Why? Because he is the head of the judiciary right now. So head of the judiciary right now is running for the presidency. And and the and in, on on his watch, uh, basically, uh, we saw that based on the judiciary order, they blocked Signal, they blocked Telegram, they blocked uh, 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 also Clubhouse is blocked on some of the uh, mobile provider in Iran. Some of them they didn't block it, but clearly the head of the judiciary they don't want to take any action. Uh, in terms of uh, if he's, he's he's saying he's in favor of internet freedom in in verbally, but he's not taking any action. And we are seeing a kind of uh, disruption on network in Iran, uh, based on the information that I'm receiving from from different people, uh, 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 different uh, basically circumvention tools developer and and uh, like IOTA map and things like that. That we are seeing kind of coordinated. Uh, uh, network disruption in Iran. So that's uh, all of that together is concerning. Uh, as I, I, I think Richard said about the national uh, security in Iran is the same is, is the case as well. So uh, when they see the national security is is in danger, they would do anything to protect that national security. So so uh, again, uh, um, having said all of these things, I think uh, uh, we can expect uh, at least a disruption if, if people uh, want to protest against the outcome of the election or in, in any shape and form. They are already contacting journalists and asking them to not criticize Ebrahim Raisi in any shape and form on social media, an article, everything. So, so the, 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 the general atmosphere is a fear atmosphere. Uh, and 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 uh, again, this this guy was in charge of mass execution after the revolution in Iran. Uh, so uh, I, I I I'm not an optimist about the internet freedom, and I think we should be high alert uh, for for worst case scenario. Hopefully, not no shutdown, but who knows? With this situation, everything is possible. Thank you very much. Um, and indeed, it's always um, important to be prepared. And um, I always say that um, it, it's a very nice feeling when you prepare very well and there's no internet shutdown. And that was the same feeling that um, Harold cited when there was no internet shutdown in Benin. All right, um, Richard. Thank you, Felicia. So what, are, what do we expect in Zambia? Our elections are on August 12th. It's a date that is in the constitution. So every five years we have elections on the PTA on, on August 5. So what we expect, and this is based on the trend, the statements and how all these ICT laws in Zambia were, uh, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, were fast tracked in parliament. You know, they, they suspended all the standing orders like the standard rules of making laws. They were suspended so that the ICT laws could quickly become law. And this is what happened. Like, Within a week, before we could blink and open our eyes, like, oh, we have ICT laws. So you can see that there the are tools that would facilitate what you, the, the worst that we expect. Like one, we expect a total internet shutdown. And uh, also <laughs> we expect um, many people to be arrested before, during, and even after the elections. And by the way, in addition to the, I'm saying this because in addition to the ICT laws that we have, the, the elections law, the Electoral Commission of Zambia Act has been amended to include a section where it is the only institution that will have the legal mandate to announce election results at any level. So in Zambia, we have got people transmitting elections from polling stations, from the polling centers, and they're sharing and they're comparing the numbers and all this and that. So with the amendment of the Elections Act, is going, that, all that is going to become illegal, whether you do it in Twitter, on Facebook, or in WhatsApp. So you can see that all of us who like to do this, because at Bloggers of Zambia, we monitor elections using technology. So we will have like, Totaling centers, we have uh, 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 monitoring electoral 
malpractices and transmitting results like um, uh, uh, number verifications and all that. So all that work is gonna be illegal. <laughs> But we're still going to do it anyway, so we should look out for our names in the media like, oh, these guys have been arrested. So that is what we expect, shutdowns, arrests, uh, all these prosecutions. Um, so with what, what we need and perhaps what, what we are doing, what is, what is happening, so we need to capacitate um, civil society, um, journalists, um, and lawyers, and, and artists with um, digital hygiene, like practical. We are trying to prepare people with the VSAT, like they are VSAT. We are preparing the cohort like to just uh, keep a certain people online and mount the campaign because it's, it's uh, just gonna be vicious. And um, we think that kind of skill, that kind of knowledge is needed in order to just prepare about all these um, negative expectations coming out of this because of the, the deep interest, the, the deep campaign against internet freedoms that is going on in Zambia. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, yeah, we'll be in touch with all of you um, to work around the elections. All right, um, over to you, Melody. Yes, I don't see any uh, more raised hands uh, from the attendees. So I think we're ready to wrap up. Uh, as discussed, we are available as a community, as the, the Keep It On Coalition. So Access Now, but also all the members of the Keep It On Coalition are always more than happy to answer to specific queries. Or um, we also have a digital security helpline if you need support in terms of securing your communication or um, support to prepare ahead of a ahead of a, an internet shutdown if you're in a in a country um, that is likely to to shut down the internet so our helpline is always um, available to to members of um, independent media uh, and it's free free it's a free service for for a civil society so please uh, although this is the end of this press briefing if you've got any uh, more questions as you are preparing your PCs and more, uh, reach out to us and let's stay connected if we can <laughs> uh, to keep it on. Thank you very much to all of our speakers uh, and thank you everyone for attending. We really believe that this is such an important issue and so that's why just having the opportunity to discuss it and we're always um, pleased when we see um, shutdowns mentioned and reported on the media, not for our ego and not just for our own, uh, the, the, the pleasure of seeing our work in the press or, or the issues that we care about in the press, but really because we know that shutting access to the internet, the, the primary goal of that is to disconnect people and to make them lose their voice and to make them lose their ability to share information very often with the outside world, but sometimes even internally. And so, of course, when there is a lot of uh, media coverage, it kind of defeats the purpose. Sometimes it completely, uh, it completely, it, it proves to be a completely uh, unproductive technique. So we believe that actually journalists are part of the solution when it comes to the fight for Keep It On. So thank you very much for, for joining and let's stay in touch if you have any more questions. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you for the design opportunity. Bye.